Okay, let's try another practice exam here for OCHEM. Uh, let's start with this first one. We've got some conditions here. We've got a cyclic alkene, and we've got these conditions here. So we do need to be able to recognize these conditions uh, as a syn anti Markovnikov hydration. Right, so th this is a little bit of a flashcard reaction. We do need to have this memorized. We need to be able to look at these reaction conditions and know that these mean syn anti Markovnikov hydration. So if that is what we are doing, uh, then we can just apply these words to the substrate. So we have this seven membered ring. A little difficult to draw one of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so. Uh, if we have an if we have a hydration, that means we are we are uh, we are adding H and OH to the molecule. So one of these atoms, one of these carbon atoms, is going to get an H. The other one's going to get the OH. Anti Markovnikov means the OH is going to go to the less substituted of the two. Right, that's what anti Markovnikov means. That is a, a element of regiochemistry. And then syn means they are added to the same side of the molecule. So let's say so let's say they come from the top right let's say they come from the top which means that the OH has to be on the wedge and then the implied hydrogen is also on the wedge which means this propyl group is on the dash right so syn does not mean that the two groups on the molecule at the end these two functional groups are syn are cis to one another it is the hydroxyl and the hydrogen that are being added that will be cis to one another so we don't need to draw that hydrogen there because it's implied but if we did it would be on the wedge and so this is the product of our syn anti markovnikov hydration uh, which is this is a hydroboration oxidation so if this looks unfamiliar check out my tutorial on hydroboration oxidation okay going on to this next one we have got these conditions here and we've got an alkyne substrate and when we see these conditions we know that we are doing a Markovnikov hydration right so once again we have a hydration we are adding H and OH this time we've got Markovnikov so the OH has got to go to the more substituted of the two right so if that is if that is what's going on we are going to be left with this. We are going from an alkyne to an alkene. So we have to show the uh, geometry going from linear to uh, the regular zigzag. And we've got an OH on there. And now we've used up one of the pi bonds, but one of them remains, right? So when we have an alkyne, one of these pi bonds is used in the addition reaction, but one of them is not involved in the addition reaction, so that will remain. So we've got our OH on the more substituted, and then the implied hydrogen is there. And then what happens, we've got an enol, and we know that en enols will tautomerize. Right, we're going to get a tautomerization, and that is going to leave us with a ketone. So we know that when we see these conditions and an alkyne, we're going to be getting a ketone. And when it's a terminal alkyne, we can say specifically which ketone it is uh, because we know that the, uh, the oxygen has to go to this carbon and not that. If it was an internal alkyne, we might get a mixture because we could have two different secondary uh, two different uh, situations, right? Two secondary carbons, each getting the oxygen, so we could get a mixture of products. But here we know what is going to happen. We're going to get this ketone as the product. Okay, number three, we have uh, an alkene. We have a terminal alkene, and we have HBr, so we're going to be doing a hydrohalogenation, but we do have, uh, we do have peroxides. So when we see peroxides, we know that we are going anti-Markovnikov. That is the regiochemistry that we're going to get here. This is an anti-Markovnikov, in this case, a hydrohalogenation. So when we have an anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation, remember this goes by a radical mechanism. If you're curious about this mechanism, I have a tutorial on specifically this reaction. You can see the whole mechanism, but long story short, because it's anti-Markovnikov, we know that bromine is going to the less substituted carbon in the, uh, of the two that are participating in the double bond, which means that we are going to get this as the product. 
right? This were, these were the two carbons in the double bond. Bromine is now on the less substituted of the two. That is our anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation. Okay, draw the most stable conformation of the following tri-substituted cyclohexane, and then denote all sources of strain in this, com in this conformation. So we're going to have to draw two chairs here. So here's one, and then here's the other. So for this one, remember, we can put the groups anywhere we want, or we can put, let's, let me clarify, we can put the first group anywhere we want. Uh, so I'm going to just arbitrarily say that this carbon is this leftmost carbon, and it has a methyl group pointed up, right? So now let's go around. We've got one, two, right, two this way, boom, boom, we're going to go clockwise. We've got a phenyl pointing down, so there is our phenyl group. And then going the other way, one, two, we've got a methyl pointing down. So one, two, methyl pointing down. Now, over here, uh, this is the other chair confirmation. So if you are unclear on how to draw chair confirmations, check out my tutorial on that subject. But this is the leftmost carbon. It's going to remain the leftmost carbon. And this methyl is up, so it will remain up. But from axial, it is now equatorial. Right. Now going over here to this phenyl group, we now have this phenyl group pointing down and it is now axial. And then two over from here, we have this methyl group which is down and now axial. So let's compare. We've got uh, a CH3 equatorial and then we've got a phenyl axial and a CH3 axial. Then over here, we've got CH3 uh, equatorial, right? So over here we've got a CH3 equatorial. Uh, oh, sorry, this is actually, uh, I made a mistake. This is, uh, we've got uh, equatorial methyl, we've got an equatorial phenyl, and we've got an axial methyl. Over here we have a, a an equatorial methyl, and then we have a phenyl that is axial and a methyl that is axial. Right. So what's the difference here? Well, we've got in each case, we have one equatorial methyl and one axial methyl. So those are the same. Therefore, we're comparing the phenyl and also the phenyl is uh, much, much bulkier than the methyls. So there's a higher premium on that being uh, equatorial to begin with. But uh, it, it is clear that everything else is the same. Right. Equatorial axial equatorial axial, so phenyl equatorial versus axial, this is definitely the uh, more favored uh, confirmation. So we're going to circle this as the more favorable confirmation. And then just to be thorough, it says clearly denote but do not quantify all sources of strain in this, in this uh, confirmation. Well, we do have some diaxial interactions Right, we've got uh, some diaxial interactions here. There's only one axial substituent, so there are diaxial interactions. But certainly, this is the more stable of the two chair conformations. Okay, a little bit more to go here. Draw a specific structure for each of the following. The enantiomer, a diastereomer, a structural isomer, and a conformational isomer of this alpha hydroxy ester. So here's the molecule, and we have some, uh, some things we want to draw. So first we want to draw the enantiomer. So to draw the enantiomer, we could do two things. We could draw the mirror image. Uh, so we could just take a mirror plane right here and reflect it across. That's one way you could do it. Um, but if you were to draw the mirror image and then flip it back around to try to superimpose it on this, uh, you would find that all of the uh, chiral centers have inverted. So when you are drawing a, um, uh, an enantiomer, uh, it is the case that you simply need to invert all of the stereocenters. So let's do that. So we will invert that one and we will invert that one. Uh, we don't have to draw the methyl. So that will suffice for drawing the enantiomer. Now, if drawing the diastereomer, we've got two chiral centers. So if, if an enantiomer involves all of the chiral centers being inverted, a diastereomer involves at least one but not all of the chiral centers being inverted. So in this case, we have two. So just pick one of them 
and invert one of them. So let's say we draw this, and I'm arbitrarily going to decide to invert this one. The hydroxyl is now on the dash and not the wedge. We also could have put the methyl on the wedge instead of the dash. So when you invert one but not all, you are getting a diastereomer. It's only when you invert all of the chiral centers that you get the enantiomer. Now, for a structural isomer, that means uh, that means differing connectivity, right? This is no longer a stereoisomer, which has the same connectivity necessarily. Structural isomer, we can change the connectivity. So, what do you want to do? Uh, let's just let's just put the hydroxyl over here instead, right? You can do anything you want. You can well, not anything you want, but just make sure it's as long as it's the same number of the same types of atoms. You can put them together however you want, and that's going to be structural isomer. The easiest way to do that is to just take a functional group, pluck it off, put it somewhere else. That will qualify. Uh, and then a conformational isomer. Uh, that means we're going to rotate some bonds. So let's, uh, I don't know, let's just arbitrarily rotate this bond 180 degrees. Let's just say that. So that would mean that uh, we'd have this part is the same. We'll have that ester. Uh, let's even have this part exactly as it is, but now we're going to go like this and then up here like that and we'll have the methyl over here. So this, this just means that we rotated a bond. It's the same molecule, right? It's exactly the same molecule. We've just rotated something in this case here, which means this from the dash flips over onto the wedge, and then this remains in plane, but just pointed up like that. So that's one way you could do it. You could have rotated this bond. It just means more stuff you would have had to uh, draw. So that seemed to, to me to be the easiest way to do it. So this is a great one, right? Just re reinforcing the definitions of enantiomer, diastereomer, structural isomer, and conformational isomer, and making you apply them to a particular structure. Uh, last bit here, we've got these two. Uh, we want to identify the conditions that we can employ to achieve these transformations, uh, both of which will take more than one reaction. So this is a little bit of a synthetic strategy uh, thing going on here. So here we notice that we've got this and we want to end up with that. Uh, so it looks like we could be doing some SN2. However, note the retention of stereochemistry, whereas SN2 involves an inversion of stereochemistry. So what is the solution to this? Well, what if we just do two SN2s, right? What if we uh, what if we do an SN2 with uh, with the bromide, and we get that? Put the bromine on there. We invert the stereochemistry, and then let's just do another. So let's uh, now introduce the nucleophile that we want, right? In both cases, we're going to do SN2, right? There's your SN2, and there's your SN2, and if we invert the stereochemistry twice we get back the original stereochemistry, right? So that's the uh, nucleophile we wanted on there and the stereochemistry that we want. And then lastly, how do we get over here? Okay, we've got o -tossyl. We know what the tosyl group is and we know that we can tosylate hydroxyls, uh, right? So we need a hydroxyl group in order to get the tosyl group on there. So how do you get a tosyl group from, or sorry, how do you get a hydroxyl from, uh, uh, from a ketone, how do you get an alcohol from a ketone? You gotta reduce, gotta do a reduction. We need a reducing agent. In this case, ketone, it'll be fine to use sodium borohydride. Also, lithium aluminum hydride is acceptable. However, because it's so powerful in the lab, it would be impractical to do. It's not wrong, just you know, we would almost certainly be using sodium borohydride to get this uh, secondary alcohol. It would be racemic because the hydride could attack from either side. So we will get the racemic secondary alcohol and that's why they specify that there so that you don't stress out about stereospecific reduction. Uh, and then we're just going to do tosyl chloride in pyridine and that is going to get us our, uh, our uh, O-tosyl there. So that's those ones. Uh, and then actually we got two more here. So two more of these uh, getting the, the right reaction conditions. So this is a synthesis right here. We're, we're attacking on some additional carbons. Uh, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, five carbon terminal alkyne, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon alkene. So how are we going to do this? Well, if, I do have a tutorial on this. What we can do with terminal alkynes, uh, we can do this. Let's say we have um, uh, sodamid, right, NaNH2, 
we can uh, grab this. We have uh, an exceptionally strong base. Na2 NH2 minus is an exceptionally strong base. Alkynyl proton, pKa around, uh, what is it, 25, 29, it's in the 20s. It's, uh, so it's not, not, not that acidic, but it's just acidic enough that an extremely strong base can go ahead and grab that. So we're going to have this. So now we've got that uh, alkynyl anion, um, and uh, now that th now this can do SN2. So we need to tack two more carbons on there. So let's just have this attack, uh, let's say, ethyl bromide. That's fine, right? We're going to do an SN2. going to tack on two more carbons there. So there's that. One, two, three. We've got our triple bond and two more carbons. Now we've got a seven-carbon internal alkyne, but we want the alkene, right? We want the alkene, and we specifically want the E alkene. So remember, we do have two sets of conditions we can employ to go from the alkyne to the E or the Z alkene. In this case, we want the one that is uh, sodium metal, and we've got uh, ammonia, liquid ammonia in there. Uh, that's not Lindler's catalyst. That would give us the Z. So we've got these conditions to go from the alkyne to the E alkene. So this was a quick, uh, quick three-step here depropanate SN2 with ethyl bromide, and then uh, reduce to the E alkene. Uh, okay, now one more thing here. This is an interesting one. We've got a five carbon, uh, cy we've got cyclopentene, and then one, two, three, four, five. All right, so we have five carbons there, um, and so we're not, we don't have to add any carbons, but we do, have to, uh, we do have to break this up. So what reaction do we know that can cleave alkenes? Right, we want to cleave this alkene, right? Well, uh, ozonolysis will do it, so that's a very good idea. However, let's think about this. What kind of workup do we want to use? Do we want to use uh, a reductive workup that would leave us with aldehydes, or do we want to use an oxidative workup that will leave us with carboxylic acids? Well, we have oxygen-containing functionality here. We, we want to end up with esters somehow. So let's do ourselves a favor and get those oxygen atoms there to begin with. Otherwise, we have to do a lot more chemistry to try to get oxygen atoms there. So let's do uh, sorry oxidative workup. If we do oxidative workup, we are going to get this dicarboxylic acid Right, so we're actually almost there already. So we 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 cleave that alkene, and we've got this situation here. So now we want to go from carboxylic acid to ester. What do we know? How do we know how to get from a carboxylic acid to an ester? Well, to me, the first thing that comes to mind is Fischer esterification. Right, esterification goes from carboxylic acid to ester. So we do need uh, acid catalysis. Uh, to do this, right, we need uh, some acid catalysis to do this, and uh, we're going to do this with methanol, right? Uh, so that's going to protonate the carbonyl, alcohol attacks, kicks that off. So that is how we're going to go from the carboxylic acid to the ester. So we did ozonolysis with oxidative workup, and then we did Fischer esterification. And uh, so that's it for uh, exam three. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.